It's episode 186 of the Author Stories Podcast. I'm your host, Hank Garner. Thanks for listening in each week. You know, we're quickly running up on 200 episodes in three years of the Author Stories Podcast. It is crazy. I cannot believe that we've been going this long, and it's because of you, the listeners, Uh, because each week new people tune in. I get feedback from people. I get letters, and uh, I just want to say thank you for listening. Click on over in the right-hand sidebar at hankgarner.com and subscribe to the show. Uh, That's how other people find it. You know, the more people subscribe and download the show, the higher we go in the rankings. And then when people are just browsing around for new things to listen to, they see our podcast there. And uh, it's because of you, the listeners. And I just wanted to say thank you. I'd also like to say thank you to some sponsors this week. And if you'd like to be a sponsor of the Author Stories Podcast, send me an email at authorhankgarner at outlook.com, and I'll be happy to talk to you about it. Uh, But this week's sponsors, uh, Keyport Cthulhu by Armand Rosamelia, Caitlin Rosamelia, and Chuck Buddha. Keyport Cthulhu by Armand Rosamelia, Caitlin Rosamelia, and Chuck Buddha. Uh, New version revised and expanded for 2017. The painting forced him to move back with such suddenness he nearly fell over the side of the old wooden railing. It depicted a grisly scene, as if your worst nightmare had been splattered on canvas. Despite his mind screaming to look away, he could not avert his eyes. Set in the New Jersey fishing village of Keyport, where the esoteric order of Dagon has been planning for the awakening of the Deep One all these years, who can survive when Cthulhu rises? Include several bonus stories, the steampunk tale Rats in the Cellars, Cthulhu Unicorn, co-written with Caitlin Rosamelia, Lockbox, previously unreleased, and two Lovecraftian tales from author Chuck Buddha, The Terrible Old Man of Keyport, and Dark Waters of Sin. Keyport Cthulhu is available in print and ebook from Amazon.com as well as Kindle Unlimited. Also, Out of the Gray, book one of the Hanaria series by Patricia Gilliam. When an Earth-based terrorist group targets Hanaria's ambassador, two teenagers become entrapped in the conflict. Alex Varen is the son of an Earth Independence Party representative and doesn't want to follow his father's path of political manipulation and corruption. Rika Miller is the adopted daughter of an engineer and nurse who later discovers she's not human, but Hanarian. Alex must decide between his family loyalties and saving the life of an alien he's been taught to fear and hate while Rika searches for the truth of what happened to her birth parents. Book one in a five-book series, Out of the Grave by Patricia Gilliam. Also, I've got a spot coming up from my friend Stefan Boltz and also from Draft to Digital. And uh, thank you for listening. Stay tuned after the show for an audio clip from Richard Gleaves and his Jason Crane series. Uh, I recently heard that Richard is starting a new trilogy in this series. Really excited to hear that. So uh, stay tuned after the show for that. Thank you for listening to the Author Stories Podcast. Six String, the new book by Stefan Boltz. Jennifer Dalton dreamed of being a singer for as long as she could remember. The dream has kept her alive throughout a childhood mired in poverty in a broken and abusive home. When her younger brother dies and her mother takes refuge in alcohol, the emotional toll becomes unbearable. One morning she runs away, taking with her the one thing she owns, her beloved six-string guitar. This is the story of a girl finding herself alone in the good and the bad, the friends she makes, and a choice that could rob her of everything she's won. Six String by Stefan Boltz, now available on Amazon.com. Hey there, Author Story listeners. This is Kevin Tomlinson from Draft to Digital, and I know that you have a book sitting there just waiting to get out to the world, and you're kind of wondering what the next steps are. So that's why you need to go visit drafttodigital.com slash author stories. That's draft, the number two, digital.com slash author stories. And that's where you're going to find all the help you need to go from having a book on your hard drive to having it on someone's Kindle or iPad or other reading device. So go visit drafttodigital.com slash author stories right now.
Well, thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories Podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Uh, today, I'm really excited to have Tess Garretson on the show with me today. You may uh, be familiar with her many, many uh, thriller books that she's written. Uh, some of them uh, were used to uh, uh, to spin off a TV show, Rizzolian Isles. Uh, welcome to the show, Tess. Oh, well, thank you for having me. Sure. Uh, I begin each uh interview with the same question and that question is what is your first memory of wanting to be a writer or storyteller i think i was about six or seven years old um and i knew i wanted to tell stories then in fact i th- i wrote my very first book when i was about seven really what what was it yeah it was it was a book about my dead cat so <laughs> <laughs> I guess I always was it was headed towards the mystery genre. Yeah, yeah, that's uh that that could be a little dark for a 7-year-old. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. So, uh did were your uh your family were they storytellers? No, they weren't, but my mother was an avid reader and she we always had books in the house and um back then they had, you know, a whole volumes volumes of readers digest condensed books yes. which turned out to be a pretty good way to get into fiction as a teenager. Um, you know, the books were short. You can you could absorb the whole story in a very condensed form. And so I grew up um, in a house full of books, but I also grew up with a mom who loved horror films. Ah. So we went to a lot of horror films, and I think that that, you know, I learned some storytelling from, from Hollywood as well. Wow. How old were you when you started watching horror films? Oh, I was probably about seven or eight. You know, there was, <laughs> they didn't. They didn't have ratings back then, and um, and so we, you know, the whole family went, and I had a little a little brother, and so we screamed a lot in movie theaters. But we had a great time, and I think I learned uh, from that experience that the height of entertainment is to scare your audience. That that's that's really what it's all about and uh, probably absorb that a little too deeply. <laughs> <laughs> uh did did any um did any movie stand out more than than any other to you uh then? Yeah, I I can tell you which one haunted me. Um and it was the original black and white version of Invasion of the Body Snatchers. And I, when I, you know, I think, why, why did that bother me so much? Why did, why did I find that so frightening? Because it really, there was no blood and gore back then. Um, but it was a, it was really deeply psychologically disturbing for a child. It was about, um, the, for, for your listeners who don't really know what the story is, um, it's been remade a couple times. Um, it's about these pods that come from outer space, these giant plants. And as you sleep, the pods, absorb your body they and they they make a, a duplicate but your your mind is gone it's not you anymore it's just something that looks like you um and nobody can tell the difference so for a child it's very scary to think i wake up one morning and and there's my mommy but it doesn't i know it's not my mommy nobody believes me but it's it's she's it's somebody different so i i think you know after a lot of thought about the psychology of this story. I realize it's it's very much a, a metaphor for alienation, for people who were supposed to love you suddenly stop loving you. You know, for for husbands and wives that become estranged. It's, so it it had a lot of meaning for me. And, and isn't that uh, you know I I have said numerous times that that I I'm not really a big fan of horror. And I think what I, what I'm really not a fan of is, uh, is slasher stories and just the, right. the blood and guts. But what I do love is a good, uh, tense psychological thriller that scares you to your bones, uh, with, by the things that maybe are not said or the things that, uh, that leave you to fill in the blanks. And I think that was the right. beauty of some of that early horror. Uh, was that it had the ability to do that. Right. You know, um, I think that horror in the old days, it, they took, it took uh, its time. Movies took their time. And, you know, when you go back and you look at, say, the original, The Thing, um, you, you think, this is really slow. <laughs> uh, because we're judging it by nowadays where things have to go bam, 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 or Hollywood thinks nobody's going to sit in their, in their chair and watch it. Uh, and I miss those old, slowly developing horror films where, yeah, as soon as you see the monster, this, this tension is all gone. 
Um, but as soon as, as as long as the monster is out of sight, your imagination can make it far worse than anything a special effects artist can do. And, and Hitchcock was a uh, master of that. The kind of the, right, the long right. setup and and getting you to really care about the characters first, uh, because then when they're in jeopardy, you're invested. That's exactly right, and I, I um, you know, I, I mourn the loss of those kinds of stories. Nowadays, when you look at horror, uh, there's it's a great deal of blood. There's a lot of slasher stuff. There's a lot of uh, horror f- teenagers. So what you find is the characters are much younger. They're not mature. They're you know they're they're kids trying to trying to stay alive. Um, and so for those of us who are adults who love horror films, it's it's you know they're not meant they're not meant for us anymore. Right. Right. Um, a lot of the authors that I talk to on the show have a very similar story to yours that uh, somewhere around five, six, seven, eight uh, years old, that storytelling bug is is planted. And uh, or maybe it's the thing that's always been inside us, but it, it somehow uh, gets woken up around that age. And then uh, for the rest of our lives, we will be storytellers. Now, whether we write and publish is one thing, uh, but there's there's something there that just separates storytellers, I think. Um, and and what I love to – the reason I ask that question is because it, it allows me to, to really get to um, – to the journey from there to where you are now. And most people with, uh, with few exceptions, uh, most people do not pursue writing immediately and then become, you know, a published author and all that. We all have these really circuitous, uh, paths to where we mm-hmm. are now. And, and yours, uh, from what I've seen is, is really fascinating. You did not, uh, pursue writing right away. Uh, what did you do for your career? Well, I grew up in a kind of with a fairly conservative Asian American father, um, who felt that writing was not a way to make a living. Um, and and for the most part, he's just probably right. <laughs> he sounds um, like most he, fathers. He, <laughs> yes, he convinced me that I should be in a much more uh, secure profession. So I went to medical school to make him happy. Uh, but I like science anyway. I mean, it was not that much of a leap for me to want to become a doctor. So I did, I did, I became a doctor. I became a a board certified internist. Um, but, um, that writing bug never left me and I continued to write short stories. And even when I was on my internship, I would write in in the on-call room. Um, and I finally wrote my first novel when I went on maternity leave, uh, with my first kid. What, what were some of the things that you were writing uh, in the interim, like you said, when you're uh, you know, in the on-call room and you're writing? What sort of things uh, were capturing your imagination? I was writing short, short science fiction really? stories. Um, yeah, I was writing um, a little bit about uh, some nonfiction stuff about what it, you know, about what it was like to be a doctor. Um, things for articles. I think I wrote, I, I did sell a um, couple to the student medical association and a couple short stories in some very small science fiction collections but that was it i mean it wasn't um it wasn't until i went on on maternity leave that i wrote a novel that um would actually pay me uh for the time <laughs> right uh it it's really interesting that uh that you were writing science fiction uh short stories because science fiction is that that kind of one lone holdout genre that has had a marketplace for short fiction for decades, and Absolutely, and and thank yeah. God for that. That's uh, you know, I think a lot of people would not have been able to cut their teeth if it weren't for you know some of those great journals and magazines and uh, anthologies yeah. that have been out there. Um, that's right. That's, that's wonderful. Well, you know, I was a big fan of Isaac Asimov's. Um, you know, oh, weren't we all? He used to love, you know, write short stories, and you know, and and those were small. They were sto- um, um, besides his novels, his longer novels, but they were science science fiction short stories. I mean, there was a golden age back then, and and it's still it's still yeah. there. The audience, unfortunately, for science fiction remains fairly limited compared to other genres. Sure. So it's it's a little harder to make a living as a, as a, as an SF writer, right? Uh, what was that novel that you wrote on maternity leave? It was a romance novel. It was a, a romantic suspense. Um, and people always are surprised when they find out that my first nine novels were romantic suspense. 
um, it was because I was introduced to romance by one of my patients, and uh, she just handed me this bag of Harlequin romance novels when she left the hospital, and um, I devoured those in a couple of weeks. And I thought, well, I I love these. Why not write what I love to read? And so, um, yeah, it was a romance novel. But um, I should add that it had a number of murders in it, so I was already doing, you know, murder <laughs> murder mysteries. Oh, what um, what was it? You said you wrote nine uh, uh, rom- romantic suspense novels. Right. I, my first published, my first nine published novels were romantic wow. suspense. Wow. Uh, what was it about that? genre or that that mix of genres that really intrigued you well you know um i first of all i loved reading romance novels but i also loved reading mystery novels and romantic suspense is uh, sort of smooshing them together so you have 50 percent of the story is has to do with a man and woman falling in love and the other 50% is there's a mystery involved. So it's um, very much the mystery that brings these two together. And in the course of solving the mystery, they fall in love. So, you know, it was like sort of the best of everything. Yeah, right. Did you find those books easier or harder or just a, a different skill at all from writing the SF stuff that you were writing? Well, it's a different skill um, because you're juggling – romantic suspense forces you to jug- juggle many things. I mean you are juggling a love story and just telling a love story that um, uh, is somehow new or different or, or um, you know, intriguing, um, that's a skill in itself. I've, I've always admired romance novelists because they're telling a story, uh, as Beauty and the Beast would say, a tale as old as time, but saying it in a, in a new and, and fresh way. Um, and then when you combine it with the crime story, um, it's it's a lot of balls to keep juggling right, in the air. Right. I have some very dear friends that write uh, romantic suspense uh, novels, and I admire uh, their ability to uh, to tell a suspenseful story um, that tugs on the heartstrings and really tells very human stories. Uh, it it is a, a definite skill that uh, I think a lot of people kind of look down their nose on those types of books, but um, it, it really takes serious skill to, to weave all those things together uh, and, and to tell a story that, that really anyone can enjoy. Right. And, you know, um, I, I know that there is no easy genre sure. to write. They're all difficult from science fiction to Westerns to, to romantic suspense. So, um, you know, I, I, it, it disturbs me when people put up their right. noses. You know, they, they turn their noses at any, any particular genre because it takes skill to tell a story. And, it, you know, all you're doing is, is choosing the style that you're going you're gonna to be telling the story in, but you still have to be a good storyteller. Sure. And, and to, uh, to act like any, uh, any aspect of life is not worth uh, writing about uh, is silly to yeah, well, I have I have this this really funny story. I mean, because um, romance novelists are always we're we're always well, you know, frowned upon by other other novelists. And there was a story that came out of the Western Writers of America. There was a a meeting where they they were grousing about the popular popularity of romance novels. And one man just said, "I don't know what's so popular about these romance novels. They're nothing but fantasy." <laughs> And one woman stood up. She, one woman stood up, and she said, "A woman is more likely to have a romance than a man is to have a horse." <laughs> <laughs> so that put him in his oh, place. <laughs> yeah. Well, as as someone who uh, has uh, has been married for a long time and 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 has uh, has a romantic relationship, and I've had horses. Uh, yes, they, they're, they're two very. Yeah, you're much more likely to to fall in love and have a family than than that for sure um so you you wrote nine of those uh books well first off when you're on maternity leave uh you uh you had been enjoying these books so you wrote this kind of story what did you do with that story when you finished it uh uh, you obviously got published but uh did you have any idea uh how that was going to happen and uh, kind of walk me through that well, okay. Um, I did it the old-fashioned, traditional way, which is I um, I sent it off to a literary agent, and at the same time, I sent it into Harlequin Intrigue, which is you know, a house of romance, which is Harlequin. Um, and I heard back from both almost simultaneously. So um, the agent took me on. 
called to say that they were they wanted the book. So I got both an agent and a publisher at the same time. Um, now that's 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 kind of a I'm I'm shortening the story because I did have some um, some manuscripts that were turned down. I mean, I had my share of rejection letters, so I understand what that feels like. Um, but that's how I, my first book got published. Wow. Um, and uh, you wrote nine of them, so I'm assuming that uh, that you had some success there and, and uh, the publisher wanted more? Yes. Um, I, I ended up uh, – so not, my first nine published novels were romantic suspense. Um, and I learned in the process um, – and I went through the same things that other writers go through, which I had a terrible case of second book syndrome. Right. It took me a long time to finish the second book, and that seems to be standard for a lot of novelists. Um, I learned to turn in work on time uh, and polished. I learned to work with editors. I, that, I just felt that was a really good education, those, those first that, you know, those first ten books, nine yeah. books. Uh, talk just a little bit about that second novel syndrome, because that, that is something that we don't yeah. talk about a whole lot. Um, but uh, I, I've heard uh, music industry people have a similar kind of thing. It's like uh, it's like a, a band or something works for years and years and years to to uh, get to the place where they can uh, you know get a, a record deal and that sort of thing. Uh, and I'm dating myself by using words like that. Uh, but uh, you know, and then when you become successful, you've had all that time to craft that first one. And then people want to follow mm-hmm. up, and uh, you know right. a lot of people are uh, are shopping for drapes when they should be, uh, uh, you know, writing uh, writing a second album because they have money now that they've never had before, and all of a sudden life changes. Uh, what is yeah. it? How is that similar to to a novelist with second book syndrome? And is it is it a fear of success? Is it uh, you know, not trusting that you can duplicate what you did the first time, or kind of what is it about that that uh, tends to affect writers? Well, it's a little bit of everything. For, for me, it was my first book was so well received. Um, you know, it was nominated for a Rita Award. My editor was very excited about the second book, and she kept finding asking, "Where's the second book coming?" And um, you know, you're right. You put all your effort, all your all your creativity, and you take your time to write that first book, and you take your time to to um, to polish it, and you've had a chance to think about the the uh, the plot a long time. So you know, that first book may take a couple of years. Now they want book number two within another year. So um, I was paralyzed. I I kept starting books, and then I would abandon them. I think I must have had like three abandoned stories where you'd write the first couple of chapters and you think, oh, this is going nowhere, and you'd toss it aside. Um, What I learned from that was that it's really important to write the first draft. Just complete the first draft. Forget about the flaws. Don't look at the flaws. Just just get something down on paper, and then you can fix it. So that was a lesson I learned from from my struggles. It was so my first book was published in eighty seven, and my second book was not published until nineteen ninety. Um, so that was a couple of years that I had to go through where I just could not deliver. Um, and I I think this is true for a lot of people, especially if you have a really successful first book. You know, people are going to be disappointed in in book number two, and you cringe at the thought of having it hit hit the you know hit the bookstore being a flawed uh product wow that's uh so so three years between those uh two books what what was it that finally broke through for you um i think i finally just said it's time to finish a manuscript and uh and there i went and i finally i finally finished it i mean i had the idea i i knew what the idea was i just kept you know would I would get bored, and this is this is very true with every single book I've ever written. Somewhere around a third of the way through the first draft, I see the flaws. There's so many flaws. It's so bad. It's just like you know, it's a piece of crap. I just, nobody wants to read this, and I put it aside. And I think, oh, but I have another idea, and I'll start another book. Um, and that's that's very much what happens with a lot of beginners is that they 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 don't realize that it's important to just finish the book, even though it's 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 terrible. Um, so that was what I had to go through. Was I had these these half finished books. Um, I what and what finally did it, I guess, was I just uh, I just sat down and I kept on working with that 
flawed second book until it was finished, and then I polished it, and then it was fine. And uh, the you know the saying that that you can't polish nothing or, or you can't edit nothing. It, it's better to have a right. uh, a steaming pile of of whatever that you can edit than <laughs> you know just thin air. So uh, yeah, you know Nora Roberts I think had the best quote. She said um, she said I can I can fix a bad page, but I can't fix a blank page. Yeah, and I've always you know I think that's just one of the best quotes. Oh, ever. that is that's fantastic. That's uh, that's succinct and uh, perfect. Uh, were you were you still practicing medicine during this time? Um, when I was writing my second book, I was working part time okay. um, because I had two kids at home. By yeah, then. I was going to say and you're I, a I you're have... a new mom on top of that. Right, right. So I had two two little boys, and I was working about five hours a day. So it wasn't it was I I it was. I mean, it was possible to handle that, plus write a little bit every day. Um, my husband had to be very tolerant, and it led to some tension because he thought I was just pursuing the silly hobby. Uh, and it, it took a while for him to realize, no, I'm very serious about this. This is what I really love to do. And um, after I'd sold a couple, he began to think that, well, you know, maybe maybe there's something <laughs> to this writing career. Uh, yeah, I, I love that. Um, what do you think? Maybe there's some folks listening who live with a writer, uh, and uh, and God love them uh, if they do. But uh, what can people do to uh, to encourage the writer in their life who may be struggling with something like that, uh, and, and and maybe can help them get over that hump? You know, it's tough being a spouse of a writer. Um, I used to teach a um, a workshop for for doctors who want to be writers. And we would always set aside a, an hour over the weekend for spouses to come in to explain to them what writers are like. Um, you know, one of the problems of being married to a writer is oftentimes the writer is, your, your, your spouse is sitting there. They are physically present, but mentally or emotionally they are not. They are thinking about something else. They're thinking about their characters. They're listening to voices that don't exist. So, um, you have to learn that the writer is is not listening to you because he's got another story going on in his head, um, and that's tough to take. Um, and you also have to, I guess, accept that there's going to be time away from you that is spent alone in an office somewhere. Um, and some spouses can't take it; they get very, very jealous. Um, and finally, there are some spouses who are a little afraid that they're that the writer's spouse will become successful and um, that suddenly it's not the same old husband you knew. Suddenly he's going off on book tour and that's scary for some, you know, for some people. So I, I, but I think that what you have to remember is that you married this person, you love this person and the writing, the writer is part of them. You, you know, it's something that is important to them. And if you love them, you will accept that. Right. I think that's great advice. Um, after, while you're, uh, after writing these, uh, the first nine or ten uh, romance novels, you shifted into medical and crime thrillers. What was that switch like for you? And um, was it a conscious thing, or, or did you, did you just start getting ideas for different stories and, and pursuing a little different vein? Well, it was all based on a conversation I had with a, um, a homicide cop. Um, so here I was, known as a romantic suspense writer, and um, he told me something. He said. He'd been traveling in Russia, and he heard rumors that children were being were were disappearing from the streets and were being sent off to the Middle East as organ donors. You know, cut open their their organs, removed, and um, I was horrified by this, this idea. Yeah. Uh, and I couldn't stop thinking about it because I had you know I had two kids. I imagined them being kidnapped. Sure. Um, so I remember thinking this is a medical suspense novel. This is really all set in the world of medicine. But up until then. I had not written a book about, I had not written a medical thriller. Here I was a doctor and I had not written about medicine, which was kind of crazy. Well, it's, so, well, it, um, it's kind of crazy, <laughs> but um, I, I think sometimes there's a little fear of, uh, of doing the thing that you're so close to. Uh, well, what it was more, I think, was if you know your, your occupation really well, you think it's every day. Right. You think it's just humdrum. There's nothing special about it. Um, while other people may think what you do is really cool. Um, so I, I told my literary agent about this idea that I had, and she didn't know she, I was a doctor at the time. <laughs> I hadn't told oh, wow. her. And she said, at, after she heard the story, um, she said, well, you have to be a doctor to write a medical thriller. 
And I said, well, there's something I haven't said to you. And I explained I was a doctor, and her <laughs> response was, why haven't you been writing medical thrillers? What's wrong with you? Oh, my so, gosh. Um, yeah, that was what, um, what we had. The conversation we had was this. People like to know secrets. Readers want to know things that are hidden yeah. to them. And that is the real attraction of writing about a, a profession that you know very well. They want to know what doctors talk about in, you know, behind closed doors. They want to know um, the secrets of a profession. So that's that was what I tried to do with my with my medical thrillers was reveal things that maybe you don't know about doctors. Yeah, and, and I, I was just thinking that uh, you know people don't want to know what it's like to file insurance claims all day, which I would, which I <laughs> assume happens a lot in doctors' offices. But uh, but it's those little nuggets uh, that really uh, you know bring out the intrigue and, and things like how do you uh, how do you look for those things that people will be interested in without just getting buried in the manure? of, you know, the, the things that are just mundane? That's a really good question. And, and um, you know, because I, I, read, I read some beginning scientific thrillers from writers, and they're so boring because it's like too much, too much, too much, too much detail. Um, so my, my approach is only to put in the details that have an emotional resonance to them. Um, so for instance, if, uh, and I, and also I don't stop to explain very much. I try to give you the meaning in context. For instance, if somebody, um, if there's a, if there's a, a cardiac arrest scene, I have the doctors and nurses talk the way doctors and nurses would talk and I don't stop to explain. So, um, if the nurse says, oh my God, he's in VTAC. You don't need to know what ventricular tachycardia is. You just know it's a really bad <laughs> right, thing. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. And if you just have this dialogue go fast and you, and you, you know from the context that they're scared, that they're worried, that they're, tr they're frantically trying to fix whatever VTAC is, um, that's enough. That's enough for most people, most readers. And maybe later on it will be, you know, you, you can slip in what that means. Um, so always make sure there's an emotional context, that there's something about your, your, characters are reacting to it very strongly. Um, and if it's, um, you know, like a technical detail, for instance, I wrote a book called, um, called Gravity. And I had to describe in detail what it's like to do a spacewalk. And it's, a, it's you know, there's a lot of detail that goes into it, how you, how you um, sit in a, you know, in a special chamber and, 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 wash out your ox and wash out your oxygen for a while and how you, you adjust the, you know, the difference in pressure and how you put on your suit and all the various um, safeguards that you have once you're out of the spacecraft. You know, that, that could be very boring. But I put it in terms of what happens to you if you don't follow procedure correctly? What happens if you don't remember to, you know, to hook on your tether? What happens if you don't do this camp out? Um, how does it, what, is, what are the consequences? And they're pretty awful. You know? <laughs> what is it like to die in space is it basically the consequence. Um, and so I, I, I try to always couch these details in. If I don't do this, this will happen. And it's a very bad thing that will happen. And people are much more interested in the details because they know what the consequences are. Right. And, and you can't have consequences if you don't have a character that you, that you care about. Uh, the, the right. consequences have to matter to someone, uh, or, or else they, they don't, they don't matter. Uh, and, and you, you, uh, have a really, uh, your books are, are very character driven and you make you you make the reader care about those characters right off the bat. Uh, and that book you were just talking about, Gravity, Stephen King said, you know, that you were better than Palmer Cook and even Crichton. And, and I think that's why, because you you really uh, not only do you have the details, but the details matter because they're happening to someone that you care about. Yeah, I mean, you can't <laughs> if you don't care about the characters, you're just not going to you're not just not going to read on. And, you know, the funny thing is the characters don't even have to be nice people. Right. They can be they can be really awful people, but if there's somebody that if there's something about them that fascinates you, you're going to keep on uh, reading about them. So, um, you know, it, it, for certainly the characters that are flawed are the ones that seem the most real to us. Yeah. Um, and so I I never try to put perfect people in these stories. Yeah. Um, I picked up your book uh, not long ago, The Bone Garden, and uh, mm -hmm. that book scared me to death. I, I think there's uh, where did the idea for that book come from? Okay, well, for those who don't know what the Bone Garden is about, it's a historical novel about um, 
uh, about a killer who's going, who has killed doctors and nurses in 1830s Boston. Um, the story came to me because I was asked to do a speech about Mary Shelley, who wrote Frankenstein. And I found out on my research that her mother died of childbed fever. Um, and so I was reading about the history of childbed fever, and that I was horrified um, because the descriptions of it were that so many women uh, would go into the hospital, would have their baby, and then they'd get a fever, and they died. They would die horrible deaths a couple days later, in great pain, um, and in great numbers. There were times when 10% of uh, every woman, 10% of the women who went into the hospital died of childbed fever, um, and. What was really bad about it was that the reason they were dying was because of their doctors. Their doctors were not washing their hands, and so they were spreading this bacterial infection to every woman on the ward. Yes. So the, the descriptions of, of, of death in the hospital of childbed fever, I just thought, oh, my gosh, this is, this is a terrible setting in which to set a story. It's, it's, um, the history of medicine is quite grotesque. It's quite disturbing, and um, it makes you grateful to be living today. But what a time to set a story in! Yeah, uh, how how different was it writing something uh, that was it was a period piece, a, a historical fiction, as uh, as opposed to writing in the present? Well, research was really the the big um, the, the the difficulty for me is spending a year kind of immersing yourself in 1830s Boston and in medicine. Um, and knowing how people would talk, you know, I would, I pretty much just spent the time perusing newspapers from the 1830s uh, to find out the language, um, to find out who, you know, what was going on in Boston at the time. And I think the the part that I found the most interesting, though, was medicine. I had, um, I was able to get hold of an 1890s, sur- 19 surgical textbook that was still in use, you know, in the 1830s. Um, and it was a very detailed textbook, um, horribly so, <laughs> in that, you know, there would be a chapter on how to amputate an arm. There would be a chapter on how to amputate a leg. And it was, you know, it was told in a very dry and matter-of-fact way, but in, in so many words they would tell you, you need these many people to hold down the patient before you could start cutting because otherwise you won't have control of them. You know, and it just emphasized that these people were alive and conscious and aware when you started to cut off their arm. Um, and that, uh, that set the stage for one of the scenes in the book, which was everybody says is very disturbing, but it's, it's very real to life, uh, what it was like back then to do an amputation. Oh, yeah, that just that makes me queasy just thinking about it. Um, are you, uh, do you plan on writing any other uh, historical uh, pieces? Well, um, uh, Playing with Fire was set partly in uh, World War II Italy, so that was a historical piece. And again, that had a great deal of research involved. And um, I have in mind in the future um, to write uh, a novel about, um, yeah, about another topic in, um, in medical history, um, uh, the beginning of anesthesia. I think that's a really fascinating story. Um, because there were there were rivals involved, and in, in, uh, who gets to claim to be the first one to use anesthesia? So I thought that would be an interesting thing to tell. Oh yeah, absolutely. The 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 rivalries and the um, and the conspiracies behind things are always fun to explore. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, so uh, then you happened uh, upon this this pair of characters, uh, this pair. Uh, protagonist, uh, Rizzolian Isles, that has now uh, become a long-running series for you and that became a television series. Uh, where did these two ladies come from? Um, this was a, a series that was never meant to be a series. I, uh, <laughs> I, I wrote it. this book. <laughs> I wrote a book called The Surgeon um, in which a minor character named Jane Rizzoli, Detective Jane Rizzoli, is introduced. Um, she is the... Uh, the partner of a of another homicide detective. Uh, they're both working a serial killer case in Boston, and uh, Jane Rizzoli is described in the book as um, not attractive, kind of sloppy, um, the only woman on the homicide unit, and nobody's given her any respect. So I thought she was going to die in that book. I mean, I just I just assumed she was a sacrificial character. Um, and so I didn't spend a lot of time thinking about Jane. She kind of came in and she was unlikable and nobody liked her. She was a bitch. Uh, but by the end of the story, I, um, she had grown on me. 
because I understood essentially what her what was driving her, and that was she was an outsider who wanted to be accepted. That's all it was. And I felt great sympathy for her by the end of the story, so I couldn't kill her. <laughs> I let her live. Uh, and then I thought, wow, you uh, you survived me. What happens to you next? So I wrote a second book called The Apprentice, in which Jane Rizzoli comes back, and you see a little bit more about her story and, and um, how she falls in love. And I introduced in that second book a medical examiner named Maura Isles, who was, again, a minor character. Finished that book, and I was interested in what happens to Maura next. So then I had a series. I mean, it just happened by itself. Jane and Maura um, developed over the course of the next books. And I mean, they're now, uh, with with August um, coming, it'll be 12 books in all. And um, the readers have seen these two women become friends. They've seen them... They've seen their friendship grow so deeply that they have risked their lives for each other. Uh, now, like most friendships, they have ups and downs. Sometimes they aren't talking. Um, but it's it's this this uh, dual professional relationship that became a friendship that has really been at the center of, I think, the popularity. Well, the, the happy accidents in writing are sometimes the best things ever. Uh... Yeah. You know, I think whenever I try to plan something out, it always gets it's boring. Yeah. But when it pops up uh, on its own, you think, oh, that was always meant to be. Yeah, yeah. Uh, which brings me to a, a question. When you uh, – because your uh, your books are, are very tight uh, – they have very tight plots, uh, but they're also very character-driven. Uh, are you are you a, uh, a, a technical plotter uh, when you lay out the stories or are you kind of discovering the story as you write it? Well, I'm discovering the stories I write. I mean, I, um, I, I suppose that in the worlds of uh, those who plot and those who go by feet of the pants, right. I'm somewhere in the middle. Um, I know. I mean, there's several several things you know when you start when you sit down to write a crime novel. You know that the bad guy will be found. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know the mystery will be solved, um, and you know your two characters will survive. Um, you don't know who else is going to survive, but you know those two will survive. Um, and that's about all I know. So. When I start, I'll usually start with a what if, a question, you know, what 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 would explain this horrible crime scene? Why would um, all the kids uh, of these various families get killed? You know, you, you start off with this, this concept. And then as I'm writing, I'm, I'm playing with different theories. And about two-thirds of the way through, sometimes as late as three-quarters of the way through, I finally figure out who the bad guy is. Um, and so that's why my first drafts are really chaotic. They go all over the place. I write myself into corners. And it's only when I finish the first draft that I, I know what the story is about. I love it. And and then uh, I'm assuming that second draft you go through and clean things up and uh, right. set uh, – I fix everything. Yeah, set guns on yeah. the mantle and things like that. Right. I mean I, once I know who the bad guy is, then I think, okay, I have to go back and – you know bring in a few more clues early on, or I have to give a, a little more indication of the motivation, or I have to explain how it was done. And so then I will, you know, insert new chapters um, or rearrange things so that it all becomes consistent. Yeah. What What is your daily writing uh, habit like now uh, that you've, uh, you've published so many books and, and so established, uh, I would imagine you have a regular publishing schedule. What, what does that look like on a daily basis for you? Well, it, it kind of depends where I am in the in the process. Um, if I'm just starting off with a new idea, um, it might you know it might take me a couple of days before I finally get get up the the juice to start working. Once I'm in the middle of writing a first draft, I try to do about four pages, three pages a day, um, and that gives me a feeling that maybe in about six to seven months I could have a first draft done. Right. Um, and then that gives me you know months after that to. Um, to finish up the uh, the rewrites, <clears throat> you know, revisions for me are such an important part of writing that it does take me just about as much time to do the rewrites as it does the first draft. Right, right. Uh, with a uh, with a pair like uh, Rizzoli and Isles, uh, I, I would think that the the medical side uh, comes very easy to you, uh, but the um, uh, Jane's side with the the detective. Uh, do you rely on experts uh, that that you could bounce questions off of, or like how do you approach things that that are not your specialty, but uh, that give you uh, some expertise to tell those stories, that side of the story, uh, with with integrity? 
Well, when I when I wrote the first one, <clears throat> excuse me for the sure. cough. I've got a little tickle. Um, <laughs> I um, I went down to Boston uh, PD, and I um, and I talked with their public affairs officer, who was really really kind. Um, and so he did the tour. I met a homicide detective, um, and they answered my questions for that first book. In subsequent books, I've uh, <laughs> I have to admit. Sometimes I play with the facts a little bit. I mean, in my books, DNA DNA comes back much faster. You know, uh, the forensics comes back much faster, which we all know doesn't really work in real life. But if I was to write a book and it took you two years to get your DNA back, it'd be a really slow story. <laughs> so yeah, I play with I play with the uh, with the facts a little bit, and uh, but I find that um, what I my readers are most fascinated by are the forensics, and for that. I um, I really rely on uh, my own personal library of forensics. I also am a, I subscribe to the American Journal of uh, Forensics, and I get a lot of ideas out of there. You know, real real true crime stories, and I use those as um, sometimes as the fodder for the stories. Um, but you know, when you when you really get right down to it, the actual investigation of these novels is just part of the story. The real story is um, who are these two women, what are they going through as they solve these mysteries. And, um, and you know, the medicine part is easy for me, I know that. Um, the police work is very much just, you know, police procedural. Yeah, yeah. Um, when you've written as many books uh, as you've written, uh, you have to have days where it's just not fun. And, uh, it, oh, and it feels like work. <laughs> yes. uh, what do you do on those days? I, I, I know that uh, when you're a professional writer, and I'm, I've got air quotes here, uh, that you know some days you have to suck it up and you have to do the work whether you want to or not. Yeah. Uh, but uh, you know, what do you do when you hit that kind of slump? I, I don't really believe in writer's block uh, per se, uh, but I think there are – you know, external forces that definitely, you know, play with our productivity and things like that. Uh, what do you do when it just gets to where it's just not fun anymore? Well, you know, that's very often the case yeah. because it's, face it, this is, this is work. This is hard work. Um, for me, the most fun part of a project is early on when everything is possible, when the story is still like spinning around your head, you can't wait to figure out who did it. Yeah. Um, the hard, the worst part is about the middle of the book. I, I hate that middle. Yeah. Because um, I'm often, I'm often, my plot is blocked. I don't know what happens next, and that's that is really horrible when you don't know what happens next. Um, the way I approach it is, first of all, it does. I don't freak out about it because I know that I've gotten through it 27 times before, and I will still be able to figure out the answer eventually. <laughs> so the, the thing is not to panic, but the second thing is to walk away from it. And I have left my manuscript for as much as a couple weeks um, just doing other things. I think um, taking long drives, long, boring drives is good. Uh, travel is good. Sitting in the car with your husband driving is good. Uh, lying on a couch, staring at the ceiling. Just anything to take your mind off the story. Um, because somehow your subconscious is still working at it. And I can't tell you how many times I've had aha moments in the car. Um, well, as I was, you know, supposedly trying to concentrate on driving, my mind is still working on the story. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, your new book is called I Know a Secret, and it's up for pre-order right now. It comes out in August. Uh, what can we expect from this new book without uh, giving it all away? Well, it is the 12th uh, Rosalian Isles um, novel, and uh, Jane and Mora investigate the rather gruesome death of a horror film producer. <laughs> um, yeah, it, uh, it, 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 takes in, it, it brings in some of my own personal uh, experiences because I recently wrote and produced a horror film. Um, and I love that whole, that whole world of you know, who, who are these people who love horror. It turns out they're really sweet people. Right. They just happen to like a really sick genre of film. Um, so it, it's about that, and it's also about why, why is this woman, this dead woman, why were her eyes removed and placed in her hand? What does that mean? Um, and it also explores um, uh, a little bit about uh, art history. You know, I, when I was in, um, in Florence, I became quite fascinated by the, the symbolism that you would find in medieval religious portraits um, 
and how each saint would be portrayed in a certain way based on symbolism. Um, and so that's, that gets into the story as well. But a lot of it has to do with the, the fun and frolic of horror films. <laughs> that's fascinating. Um, when when uh, Rizzoli and Isles got picked up uh, for the television treatment, uh, how did that change your – uh, your creative process, and uh, was this a, uh, and and how did it uh, change your your career? Well, it changed my career in that suddenly people knew who these two women were. Um, and you know, readers often, I mean, writers often get asked this question: "Oh, you're a writer? Uh, well, I have heard of you." <laughs> right. You know, and then I could say, "Well, do you watch television?" And then they would become impressed, even though you know I had nothing to do with the show. <laughs> so um, <laughs> that that was what changes. Now all of a sudden, people go, "Oh, she wrote Rosalie and Dials." I didn't change my creative process at all. I mean, I still wrote the books the way I've always written them. I didn't try to alter them uh, to fit the television show. Uh, the characters on TV look quite different from my books. Uh, first of all, my books, they look much more ordinary. And on television, those two actresses are gorgeous. <laughs> <clears throat> so I, you know, I didn't try to even touch that aspect of it. I sure. just kept writing the way I'd always written these stories. I love it. I love it. Uh, Tess, thank you so much for taking time to come on the show today. I'm going to put links in the show notes to uh, your Amazon page where people can go pick up your latest book and pre-order the new one, I Know a Secret. Uh, where can people find you on the web to uh, to stay current with news? Well, they can go to uh, TessGarrison.com or they can follow me uh, on my Facebook uh, public page. Great. Uh, thank you so much for taking time to come on the show, Tess. Thank you. Thanks for listening. Now stay tuned for an audio clip from Richard Glebes. Find a link in the show notes. They sat in silence, leaning on Spook Rock. It pulsed against his back, in rhythm with his heart. He fought an urge to press his palms to it and steal its mysteries. Kate took her hand away. This fundraiser for my father's campaign, was it your idea? No, I didn't think so. You need to watch out. For what? She stood and paced, hands in pockets, avoiding his eyes. Right now, you're a free agent. Nobody knows what you can do except me and Joey. That's rare. You've got space to find your own path without everybody watching you or controlling you. How many of them, us, are there? A few handfuls of families. We used to be all over, but we're kind of dying out. The secrecy issue makes it hard for us to find each other, hard to find people to marry and the like. So we congregate in a few obvious places. Salem, Sleepy Hollow, Transylvania. Don't be stupid. There's no monsters, just people. And ghosts. Ghosts are people. They were. She held her arms out. That's all there is. People in the spirit world. And places in between. Magic places. Haunted places. Like this. We gravitate to towns where we can stick together. It sounds nice. It can be smothering. We have factions. Not all of us want to get by in peace. Some of us, my father is one, say we need to be more aggressive. Increase our numbers. Take charge of things politics, finance, fix the world. People listen. They think they're special. They don't call themselves the gifted. They call themselves the appointed, as if God singled them out to rule. My dad's a good man. He just thinks he knows what's best for everybody, and you'll be meeting his crowd. At the fundraiser, it will be mixed, mostly normals, but I'll point out the dangerous ones. My father employs a man named Mather. You can't miss him. He has purple eyes. Mather is like this rock. He'll be able to sense you. If you want to stay a free agent, you'll need to avoid him. Or else what? They'll want to recruit me? You're Ichabod's descendant. Ichabod was attacked and survived, a potential founder. They're already watching you. I'm no good to anyone. You don't believe that. Neither do I. She knelt and pushed the hair out of his eyes. 
What am I going to do with you, Jason Crane? Love me, he thought. He felt himself lean forward. They would kiss, here in this sacred place, beneath the stars. Stars? Stars? What time is it? Jason jumped to his feet. We need to go. Why? A firefly swept the air, flared yellow-green, and died. What's wrong? She followed his gaze and gasped. Fireflies swam in every dark crevasse. Faces coalesced where the lights hovered. Faces of crones and young boys and stern men. Emaciated, hale, wounded, vacant, menacing, piteous. Bodies took form. Military uniforms, bonnets, black lace, crepe, shrouds, winding sheets. Sleepy Hollow Cemetery had disgorged its dead, and that grand army of spirits now made camp at Spook Rock to await orders from their leader. A laugh chopped the wood of the forest. Jason had heard that laugh before. He squeezed Kate's hand. Run! Thanks for tuning in to the Author Stories podcast. You can find new episodes every